Oops. Oh yeah, right. Doing one of these again. Journalism. I was thinking about journalism this week because I accidentally watched the first Republican primary debate. About halfway through I realised I wasn't watching Celebrity Deathmatch and the people weren't made out of clay, they were just covered in it. But as interesting as it was, more than the platitudes, I found interesting the moderation. It seemed wildly ambivalent, and whatever your beliefs on things, some of the candidates said things that were totally untrue. Some of them made statements about rebuilding the American military, as if it's collapsed in the last three years. This doodlet here said that climate change is a hoax. In fact, basic situational awareness proves that to be a lie. But why did the moderators not push back? Why did all the people sitting on the command deck not ask why you can't be against illegal immigration without calling it an invasion? Why didn't they throw some curveballs in there and ask about, well, actual policy? It's not like I'd expect anything different from the Democrats debate, but is this what journalism has come to? I thought, as I waited for Mike Pence to pile-drive the heel into a literal puddle. But then I realised there's actually a tremendous amount of very good journalism out there, and it's just eclipsed by whatever all this is. And then I realised, actually, that's even more depressing. Phew. Because the truth is out there for anyone to find for free. And here we are talking about teachers' unions like they're responsible for the decline of the empire. Because the real news is really a never-ending river of suffering and blood and shit. And it's always been like that. I don't mean that in a doomy, apocalyptic way. Same as it ever was, dear Jumbo. That's just human history. I know what you're thinking. It's Friday, Friday, Friday! Was it right? Right in. Sometimes people have kindly said that they appreciate my journalism. But I am definitely not a journalist. I am more of a raconteurish, entertainment-type, analytical, regurgitating guy. A retard. And I think that really most people consume their news through people like that. You know, retards. They don't really go to the journalists, they get it repackaged and summarised, almost like a magazine. And I suppose that's what this is. Sorry about that. In terms of viewership and readership, you could divide the quote, news, into three tiers. The very tippy top is dominated by massive corporations, which do sometimes offer good journalism. Sometimes their reporting is biased, almost always their commentary is biased, but I've read well-balanced investigative stuff from almost all of these places. This category basically dominates not just news consumption, but the news cycle, to the point where it's worth reporting if one of these outlets doesn't report on a story the others are reporting on. Their messaging may be different, but they generally look and sound the same both on screen and in print. There are good journalists at these networks, but the vast majority of the reporting is pretty superficial pumped out quick to meet deadlines in a game of quantity before quality. Then, in category B, you get smaller outlets, most of which are just emulating the tippy top, but not all of them. This category is where you find the ProPublicas and Bastion Obermeyers and Ronan Farrows, doing the actual trench work of journalism, digging up stories, talking to sources, Sifting through sewer water with nothing but a hunch and a conspicuous matchbook, which has the villain's phone number on it. More often than not, when a big story does make it to CNN or Fox, it was first reported on by someone in Category B. Category C is where everyone else is, from people just filming themselves like muggins here, to photogenic ghouls commenting on reported stories like they actually have souls or something or commenting on the commenting of reporting stories in between the direct advertisements for dehydrated microplastics. I would argue that the companies at the top 
have gained and maintained their positions by being adaptable and profit-driven. And following profit means trying to give as many people what they want as they can. They're not just competing with each other, they're competing with changing consumer behaviour. They're competing with social media, and that very often takes the form of bite-sized chunks of information, most valuable for their ability to get people to click on a link rather than their actual information. Facebook has more than six times the monthly users than the top US news site, and social media leads the way both as an avenue to news sites and as a platform for repackaged news too. But I don't think that has actually changed the news that much. If you watch clips of the news in the 1980s, it's often just as vacuous as it is now. And just like now, there are exceptions to that. I suspect that, in fact, people who want to read thorough articles about complex topics, or even people who want to watch segments about the actual ins and outs of a nuanced story, are and always have been the minority. Probably not the vast minority, but the minority. It's not like most people don't look at the news at all, just that their mental bandwidth is taken up by everyday life and they end up passively consuming news rather than actively seeking it. I don't think that's new or wrong. I can't blame people for not wanting to look up the high crimes in Agoniland or just how many politicians, NGOs and vast swathes of the entire economy are morally compromised. The news is just a little bit depressing. And if you can do nothing to change the floods in Pakistan or the war in Ukraine, and if it doesn't affect you immediately, when there are other things that do, why bother? And there is so very, very much. So much that those immediate problems are far more attractive to report about. And it's not like they shouldn't be reported about, just that they inevitably are boiled down to their basic elements because the job of really explaining the real details of, let's say, illicit fentanyl getting into the US, is actually a dozen jobs explaining things from psychology to the last 40 years of foreign policy, so that even a loser like me with nothing better to do would have their head spin trying to work it all out. It's not inaccurate to say cartels make it and smuggle it in, just as it wasn't inaccurate to say Saddam Hussein was a horrible dictator. But it's more complicated than that. Way more complicated. And when everything is so impossibly complicated, where to understand one thing, you almost have to understand a bit of everything, it's no wonder people don't engage beyond the Adam Curtis idea of oh dearism. But like I say, I don't think it's a modern problem. And even though so much news is controlled by the rich, and embroiled with organisations and interests they should be reporting on rather than getting in bed with. Right now, it's probably as free as journalism has ever been, thanks to the internet. Citizen and investigative journalism is thriving. But it doesn't feel like the ratios have changed. For one real article, there are ten fluff pieces made to fill space. For one niche-ish website examining corruption, there are ten gossip rags. It's the vapid candy floss that people want. The mainstream presentation of journalism is in a constant feedback loop with society, where it is continually influencing public discourse, but at the same time constantly reacting to it. It is limited by its own audience, and its audience wants digestible information and highly emotional stories that are easy to understand and have opinions on, even if they don't really mean much in terms of a wider picture. In Britain, in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq, fox hunting was debated in Parliament for more hours than military intervention. Cynically, you might say it was a useful distraction. But the media generally lapped it up, and so did their audience, us. And I would say at least part of that is because fox hunting is easier to have feelings about than a very complex geopolitical situation. 
Right now, we have a terrible war in Ukraine, a shameful resurgence in extreme discourse, robber barons with politicians in their pockets and the taxman on the run. But by some metrics, the most widely consumed journalism has been the reporting on Johnny Depp's civil trial. And so, I suppose, I would say that the apathy in adults toward actually engaging in current events is probably the greatest threat to mankind. Uh, but obviously that goes hand in hand with uh, a prevalent lack of compassion, access to irreversible weapons, and the inexplicable proliferation of Velveeta cheese. I mean, honestly, garbage. It doesn't feel great to say it's like this because actual journalism isn't really sought out by the average media consumer, and probably this is one of the heaviest prices to pay for a free press, and it is surely worth it. But who is to blame? The supplier or consumer? I suppose I don't know, but some of the effect seems clear. Across the political spectrum, you can hear and see lots of people, both in media and the end consumer, talk about things when they're obviously not informed. How much of the economy actually is that? How does legislation get written? How does government work? These are things you have to look up. And of course, all these thoughts are coming at it from the perspective of information access being the priority. From a purely commercial perspective, the news and the journalism filling it isn't so much about fulfilling a public interest, but rather serving what the public are interested in. It's about keeping eyes long enough to watch the ad breaks, and eyeballs watch Johnny Depp, not an information-heavy piece about complex judicial decay where there is no obvious antagonist or obvious emotional crux. I really do think a lot of problems could be solved if more people, many more people, actually engaged with journalism and investigative journalism, and actually formed their opinions after reading thousands and thousands of words on a subject rather than just the headline. But allow me to spin this in a positive way before the weather. The internet has spread a lot of disinformation and misinformation, but it's also spread and decentralized the ability to get real information across too. And I guess is, I think Gen Pop is probably more informed than it ever has been. And who knows, maybe in a hundred years, voters will actually be able to vote people in who actually, you know, reflect their interests rather than a, a cable package with loads of channels nobody wants and a weird subscription model. So it's not all bad. Anyway, coming up next, you know him from The Revelator as Jack Axel's non-threatening sidekick. But now Jim Bob Tackoberg is here with us today to talk about his spoons after the weather. 